This is Duke University. Thank you. And I'm going to, um, I think the presentations have been, uh, flow very nicely one from the other. So we had the, um, the sweep of history from Jamil, and uh, we've had uh, from uh, Michael this you know, very uh, intensive account of the transition from uh, empire to republic. Uh, and what I'm going to talk about um, a bit more is um, uh, the way that memories of uh, the, uh, of the imperial uh, period and the transition from empire uh, to nation state um, are uh, invoked and deployed um, by different political actors uh, in, in Turkey today. Um, and I'll especially focus on uh, the site of Istanbul as, um, as basically the locus of my analysis is um, um, because the, uh, the, the, the politics of nostalgia around um, Istanbul um, really embody uh, the, the, the sort of um, phenomenon and, and tensions that I'm you know, trying to uh, put my mind around. Um, and in that sense, I have to say, I have to give the caveat, uh, I was going to say this even before I did and saying this uh, with Kam, but uh, now that he's here, it's, it's great that he can uh, hear, uh, hear me remember how, um, how much I uh, cling to his uh, happy characterization of the work of a social scientist as uh, irresponsible generalizations when we have to uh, come in the, uh, you know, Come present after historians. Um, so I do uh, ask you to all, uh, you know, recognize that um, this this work is uh, obviously empirically grounded, but it's a conceptual and sort of theory building exercise. Um, and uh, in that sense, I draw great um, inspiration from um, the very rigorous work of my uh, historian colleagues here. Um, so uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I try to take the mandate of the um, workshop um, fairly literally. Uh, and we were uh, invited in the, um, in the letter of invitation to look for, um, I understand that, uh, and you mentioned earlier that previously there was, um, uh, have been uh, discussions about um, reasonable accommodation of minority demands in uh, liberal uh, societies, um, uh, mostly in the West, Canada, uh, for example, but um, that you're also looking for alternative models um, or supplementary, supplementary arrangements to those typical liberal nation states such as those provided by the Ottoman Millet system, still exist in the some existing countries. Um, and then we, uh, you raised these three questions um, that I thought were um, a helpful way uh, to structure uh, my own intervention uh, by going through each of these questions and asking how they pertain to um, the cosmopolitics of uh, nostalgia in Istanbul vis-a-vis -vis the Ottoman past. Um, and, um, uh, and in effect, how they can help us address and how this, this experience and these debates that take place about Istanbul can help us address uh, the question that for me is really the overarching one, which I think all of these try and get at in one way, shape, or form, which is how do we live together in diversity? Um, and uh, in this sense, uh, you know, Istanbul is, I think, a, um, a fascinating site of analysis. I mean, we've heard about how it has been an imperial capital for almost three millennia. Um, and so it has brought together um, uh, groups of different uh, ethnic, sectarian, religious uh, orientation, civilizational, if you will, um, orientation uh, for millennia. Um, and yet it is also a, a fascinating place in that uh, very often one is at the heart of things, it's hard to, uh, to see things in critical perspective. Um, but Istanbul is also, in Orhan Pamun's famous uh, words, um, uh, just emerging perhaps from uh, a century of being essentially a backwater. It's never been as provincial. Uh, as it, uh, for the past 2,000 years, it's never been as provincial as it has been for the past 100. Um, or 85 or so. Um, and so uh, in that sense, it's a, it's a quite, I think, fruitful side of analysis for thinking about the relationship between empire, between nation states, and between what happens to the, to the uh, constitutive groups of uh, these forms of political organization, um, particularly the vulnerable ones, vulnerable ones within them. Um, and in that sense, um, I think we can uh, make the claim that there are, um, uh, that Although Istanbul became a backwater, although it became homogenized, and uh, along with the general uh, process of um, uh, homogenizing uh, nation building in Turkey that took place um, from the uh, 1920s onwards, um, uh, there was still a persistence. There was a certain sort of post-imperial cosmopolitan persistence in Istanbul um, that we can uh, access in various traces that were left upon the city. Um, and uh, we see these in, for example, um, 
uh, in the 1920s and 30s by the um, uh, ongoing presence of uh, the non-Muslim uh, religious communities, so the, the basically the heirs of the Milet system, um, because while uh, there was a population exchange uh, between um, Greece and Turkey uh, that led to the um, uh, more or less the um, forcible uh, removal of uh, 1.3 million Anatolian Orthodox uh, citizens and between three and, and 500,000 uh, Greek-born Muslims. Uh, and of course, there was the, uh, the depredations of the Armenian community, the genocidal uh, uh, um, phenomena of the early, um, um, of, of, of 1915, and also the, the whole sort of uh, war, um, World War I period. Um, so uh, although uh, Anatolia became um, uh, dramatically depopulated of its uh, Christian uh, population, there was an exemption for the non-Muslim minorities in, um, uh, in Istanbul. Um, and so uh, they continued to live uh, cautiously uh, with some measure of, um, uh, of trepidation vis-a-vis -vis the new um, uh, Republican nation building project. Um, but, but these communities endured and do endure today in a very, very diminished uh, numbers. And um, so there is, there is that element. Then you also have adding to this kind of these cosmopolitan uh, traces, you have uh, what Charles King has called the washing up of the flotsam and jetsam of empire from other parts of the Black Sea um, as well. So not only uh, the Ottomans, but also um, uh, remnants of uh, the sort of the um, imperial fabric of uh, the Russian and the Habsburg em Empire also passing through the city, of course, the arrival of the white Russians um, coming in and out. And this uh, lends itself again to uh, the cosmopolitan character of the city and the way that it's tangible today in street names and in uh, various types of cuisine uh, that, um, that continue to be um, uh, produced and consumed and very much commodified as, uh, as part of the sort of cosmopolitan aura that Istanbul uh, <laughs> Uh, said to embody. Um, and then um, in the 1940s, of course, you had uh, the, um, uh, the fact that uh, Istanbul, that Turkey was neutral, uh, meant that um, its great uh, city, even if the capital had been removed to Ankara, its great city, uh, Istanbul, um, is still uh, attracted uh, agents of the various allied and access uh, powers uh, because they could interact um, and, and uh, in ways that were not possible in other parts of um, Europe or Asia at that time. Um, and uh, also within this context, you have um, an influx, mostly temporary, but for the duration of the war period, of um, uh, German Jews uh, coming in who play an important role in uh, the establishment of the curricula in uh, the Turkish university system um, that uh, is, you know, continues to be um, acknowledged today. So there's, there's you know, this uh, is an, another manifestation of the persistence of this kind of cosmopolitan spirit despite um, its increasingly melancholic uh, sort of chiaroscuro uh, um, impressions that, 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 which, which is very much you know if any of you have read Orhan Pamuk's um, Istanbul Memoirs of a City I um, mean kind of talks about this kind of controversial sort of uh, interplay between the the dark and the light memories of um, uh, different uh, cosmopolitan past um, uh, non-Muslim cosmopolitan past but also a Ottoman Turkish sort of uh, very sophisticated cosmopolitan legacies that um, you know are are um, uh, are discernible in Istanbul, but um, at the same time, this this experience is very much being um, being uh, whittled away at by um, uh, by the agents of the uh, nation state, um, and you see this in several quite pernicious forms. In the 1940s, uh, there's the wealth tax um, that is basically a uh, a mechanism to confiscate the um, the property and, and the capital of uh, the non-Muslim uh, communities, in particular, affects the Jewish community, actually. Um, and then there is uh, this logic of reciprocity. So we talked a little bit about the, the, the sort of the legal um, uh, legacies of um, the millet system and the process of uh, attempting to repudiate uh, that system. And, and in terms of uh, this, this notion of reciprocity is basically um, a phenomenon that was written into the Treaty of Lausanne, which is both the foundational treaty of the Turkish Republic and which mandated the population exchange between, uh, between um, Ottoman-born 
uh, Christians and Greek-born um, Muslims, um, and uh, the treaty states that um, it's, it's, it's intended in a benign fashion, but it states that whatever happens, whatever one state does for its to, pre to protect its uh, minority, uh, the other state will do as well. And this kind of uh, becomes, uh, in the context of the Cyprus question, the internationalization of the Cyprus question becomes um, a sort of tit for tat uh, in which whenever something goes wrong in Cyprus, then uh, the Turkish government takes it out on the, um, the Greek minority and the Greek government takes it out on its Turkish Muslim minority. Um, and uh, this culminates in the 1960s and 70s in a pogrom uh, uh, called the 6-7 September events um, against the uh, sort of um, non-Muslim commercial establishments in the main sort of pedestrian and, and commercial area of Istanbul. And uh, this, this uh, intensifies uh, Greek-Turkish migration from uh, Istanbul uh, so that about 100,000 Greeks leave by the end of the decade. Um, so that, that um, sort of uh, post-Ottoman kind of presence that was still uh, discernible in Istanbul is really more or less disappears by the 1970s. This is you know, further compounded by confiscation of uh, minority property, uh, religious foundation properties um, with the um, uh, bless you, with the uh, Cyprus Devacon in, in 1973. Um, and so, uh, you know, by the time, I kind of alluded to this in our discussion in the previous panel, um, by the time of the 1990s, when you have um, a uh, policy uh, of um, recognizing, celebrating the Sephardic legacy uh, in uh, Turkey, um, there's something of a hollow ring to it uh, in terms, and, and you have some uh, Jewish intellectuals like Rifat Badi, for example, who are quite critical of this kind of uh, narrative of, you know, 500 years of uh, Turkish Jewry because it's, uh, it, it needs to be read within the context of um, systematic uh, depopulation um, of Turkey and especially of, uh, of this, this sort of last um, bastion of, uh, of sort of pluralism in this, in this post-Ottoman sense, meaning referring to non Muslim minorities um, uh, in Istanbul over the course of the 20th century. Um, but in the meantime, you have forms of cosmopolitanism seeping back in uh, to the city. And this time, it's not necessarily uh, non-Muslim um, uh, non in character, although there are also, um, uh, there is also migration with the collapse of the Soviet Union um, from of people from all parts of uh, of the former Soviet empire, including Christians, including many Armenians, for example, uh, who come as uh, migrant labor. But there's, um, but from other parts of Turkey as well, you have the influx of um, uh, mostly Muslim communities who nevertheless trouble this, um, this uh, sort of uh, secular Sunni Turkish uh, nationalist narrative that had sort of been the framing, in, you know, the, uh, the, the, the the, the frame for Turkish uh, citizenship. Um, and so these, these kind of more um, subaltern Muslims, uh, if you will, were um, uh, come in the form of you know, Kurds and Alevis, and of course the Anatolian uh, Sunni uh, majority um, that migrates uh, to Istanbul ever since the 1960s and 70s and comes to constitute a majority within the city's population uh, by uh, arguably the, the, the 1990s. One could trace that by looking at data of um, uh, census data about place of birth versus place of uh, residence. I haven't done that research, but one could. No one wants to. <laughs> so, um, uh, so and, and then, of course, in the same period, you have the neoliberalization of the Turkish, uh, the, 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 the switch to um, a neoliberal system and the opening of the economy, um, which leads to an influx of foreign capital. And so with that come the sort of the global cosmopolitans, the frequent flyers, uh, the, um, the, the, the sort of more jet uh, uh um, cohorts that um, uh, that, it, that that we often associate with cosmopolitanism in the late 20th, early 21st century. Um, so you do have this kind of very fascinating picture um, of uh, Istanbul as a site where you see, um, in terms of this relationship between um, the nation state and uh, minorities, or at least the nation state and uh, diverse groups within the polity, um, you do see uh, over the arc of the century sort of the waxing and waning of a secular ethno-nationalist uh, narrative um, that Istanbul seems to be emerging from uh, by the end of the century. So that is my answer to the first question. Um, the second question 
is uh, what do liberal majorities uh, and religious communities owe each other? And this question I thought was uh, quite interesting in the context of how to live together in diversity. Of course, you have diversity in the West and in, in Western liberal states. This may, in fact, be the right question to ask. Um, but in Turkey or in Tunisia or in Egypt or in uh, Russia or India, it's actually not the, this question that one asks, but the inverse. Um, what do uh, pro-religious communities that are majorities, um, what do they owe and what is the relationship of reciprocity that should, should pertain um, between religious majorities and liberal minorities um, in these various contexts? So it's a, it's a different dilemma. Um, and uh, it raises all sorts of questions for, for this, for, for this um, project of uh, reasonable accommodation. Um, and uh, in this sense, in, in the case of Istanbul, when we look at um, sort of the, 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 the political and cultural sort of spectrum uh, represent in the city, which is arguably microcosmic of, uh, of course, of, of the country, um, uh, you see that um, liberals are not just the minority, but they're a minority within the minority. Um, so the minority, uh, if, we're def uh, if there's a religious majority, um, that is juxtaposed to a, um, a minority that is really an oddball amalgam of all sorts of different political and cultural uh, um, tendencies. Um, so you, ha you do have bona fide liberals in the Western sense. Um, you also have a very illiberal uh, right-wing nationalist or left-wing nationalist um, uh, who basically combine a sort of a Marxist ideology with uh, a sort of third worldist nationalism. Um, you have uh, new so proponents of new social movements that are quite vibrant. So for example, an LGBTQ uh, uh, community that is becoming increasingly vocal and whose um, role uh, and aspirations you know, mesh quite awkwardly with sort of uh, classical liberal uh, aspirations. Um, and then, of course, you have cultural minorities like the Alevis. So this is kind of the big, uh, you know, in, in, in the context of what you're talking about a little bit, I think the elephant in the, in, in the room in the sense that a lot of the discussion here, um, and my, my work as well, has focused on uh, how does one manage uh, the challenges of diversity when it comes to non-Muslim minorities in Turkey. But what about Muslim minorities? I mean, here you have... Um, uh, it's hard to get exact figures, but arguably 8 to 10 million people, about 10 to 15 percent of the population, uh, is of Alevi orientation. It's a heterodox uh, tradition um, within Islam, uh, arguably closer to Shiism, um, but very much inflected with uh, Anatolian traditions and Anatolian Sufism, um, which makes it distinct from, from uh, Iranian Shiism and from the Alawite uh, tradition in Syria. Um, Alevis don't believe in the, um, uh, don't believe that the tenets that Sunnis presume to be obligatory are indeed obligatory, so they may not fast during Ramadan, women may not cover, uh, they may not pray five times a day, they may not, um, uh, the uh, Alevi congregations are in gender inter integrated uh, uh, form called Jemevis, which the um, Turkish uh, Directorate of Religious Affairs do not recognize as a house of worship, and this is a major source of Alevi grievance. They regularly apply to the European Court of Human Rights um, to protest this and also obligatory religious education. So there is a very um, uh, substantial um, Muslim minority question um, that uh, is also played out on the streets of Istanbul. And we saw this actually most, um, uh, most prominently uh, during the Gezi, Gezi uh, Park protest. Um, it was, uh, I think, not there, there wasn't a lot of cognizance of uh, the degree to which some of those energies um, were emanating from Alevi frustrations. Almost everyone, I, I, I can't confirm this, but there's reasons that uh, based on the, the names, the families, and the, um, the, the, the cities of provenance, um, I, I would uh, venture to say that uh, if not everyone who participated in Gezi was Alevi, everyone who died in Gezi was. Um, so there's a, and there's a reason why Alevis went into the heart of that, that fray, um, so a, a, a sense of vulnerability that does have to do with um, the, poly, the, the Ottoman Islamic uh, nostalgia that I'm going to talk about in a little bit. Um, so in this sense, um, uh, you have all sorts of groups, but um, uh, I would say the two that have been most articulate and uh, most coherent in, um, in, in, in positioning themselves vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the sec secular ethno-nationalism have been liberals and their pro-religious uh, uh, majority. 
Um, and there's been a lot of overlap and affinities in the critique, and there have been points of rupture uh, in, uh, in, in both the narratives and in the political project of cooperation, um, especially uh, since 2007 and then even more so in 2013 uh, for reasons that we'll discuss. Um, so uh, basically, if you have, um, you know, uh, I would say that what these, uh, this sort of liberal um, challenge to the nation state and, and Turkish ethno nationalism and the, um, I'm going to say Islamist, I'm really saying it, I don't want to say lowercase i, but I'm, I'm just using it as a generic placeholder and we can have a whole debate about who's an Islamist and who's not, but I mean, I'm really just kind of referring to a pro religious constituency, um, probably votes for uh, the AKP. Um, of course, you know, this is not all people of. I, I don't want to, basically I don't want to open up that can of worms. So just, just take it as a, as, a, as a sort of a generic identity marker for the pro-religious um, majority. So basically both liberals and Islamists have a, um, uh, have a uh, strong sense of, um, uh, of purpose um, when it comes to rehabilitating Istanbul's place in the collective uh, imagination and as kind of a, uh, as an anchor for a uh, reconstructed uh, national identity um, that uh, is very different in both the way it envisages, envisages the body politic and it envisages Turkey's place in the world vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the Kemal's project. And so, it, and, and, and this is, you know, this is kind of my, uh, theoretical plane with mirrors. Um, you know, uh, this is because Istanbul does indeed embody the universal in many uh, way, ways as a as a um, major city of 13 million people at the you know median of continents. The whole sort of trope of Turkey between civilizations, um, at but combining the lines and so forth. So you know, both uh, liberals and Islamists recognize this sort of universal and. Uh, universalistic aspect of Istanbul as a site of uh, the cosmos, um, and yet the, they're both attuned to uh, certain readings of that heritage um, that very much, uh, that very much um, uh, underscore the particularity and the sort of the civilizational and historical traction of uh, Istanbul as, uh, as heritage. Um, and yet, uh, um, in terms of the projects that they're trying to articulate, they actually end up remembering and invoking uh, very different Istanbuls, uh, very different Ottoman uh, Istanbuls. Um, and uh, the reason for this, uh, you know, the, 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 basically by mapping these debates, um, and, I'm talking, and, and when I'm talking about nostalgia here, you know, there's been a lot of work done on memory um, and memory studies, but um, there's less focus on nostalgia. And I'm actually fascinated by nostalgia as a phenomenon um, and as a, um, as, as a uh, sort of in the, as a tool within the um, uh, Hobbeswam and Ranger repertoire of uh, sort of nation building techniques that you use. Uh, you know, you mentioned some of them, you need a flag, you need a national anthem, you need a costume and so forth. Um, but I think the, the role of nostalgia um, is really fascinating. Uh, as uh, another tool, it's not just it's not just historical narrative. It's not it's not pedagogic. It also has this. Um, uh, it encompasses a quite um, uh, visceral and um, kind of uh, a powerful sort of mobilizing and emotive dimension. Um, that you know, if we, if, if we want to get more into the term, uh, it was actually nostalgia was a um, a clinical term. Uh, that was coined to describe the uh, sentiments that apparently Swiss uh, guards at the Vatican uh, used to feel when, uh, when, when spending so much time away from their alpine uh, green homelands. And when they were diagnosed with nostalgia, they would get sick leave and be allowed to go home and, and, and revisit the Alps. Um, and uh, so psychologists have continued to study nostalgia, and they find that it actually has um, several um, uh, several powerful characteristics. It, it is correlated with improved mood, improved social connectedness, um, with positive self-regard, uh, with a sense of existential meaning and fulfillment, um, with uh, an ability to, uh, to, to enable self-deception, um, and as a form of comfort. So these are all characteristics that clinical psychological studies have identified with regard to nostalgia. So I find it kind of fascinating as um, a, uh, a tool in the debates over Turkish collective identity and what role the history and the history of the Ottomans play uh, in that context. So um, I'm looking at um, uh, the debates over the Ottoman heritage uh, and its cosmopolitan nature as, um, uh, yeah, as, um, as 
a site of, of, of these sort of, of this memory work or this nostalgia work, um, as it were. Um, and so here, I, uh, in order to characterize them, I'm using uh, ideal typical renditions um, of how the world looks from uh, the perspective of uh, a liberal or a quote unquote Islamist. And as I said, I'm using these in very, uh, with, a, with a very broad uh, stroke brush, I can you know, provide you with endless footnotes qualifying and, and situating and contextualizing these to prove to you that I'm not really essentializing. <laughs> but it's just, to, it's, it's just to render this, this, this narrative and I think the five minutes I have left um, more, um, uh, more manageable. Um, I mean, basically, uh, the, the Ottoman uh, cosmopolitanism that liberals remember uh, is, dates back to the 19th century. Um, it's the Belle Epoque cosmopolitanism of the post tanzina era. Um, it's after the Millet system has been removed. Um, it is after the institutionalization of uh, citizenship, of individual-based citizenship. Uh, and it is, uh, involves a, um, in terms of the, uh, the, the sort of iconographic figures in it, um, uh, there's a certain el elitism to it. It, it, it entails a, um, sort of a, a very romantic um, uh, rendition of the role played by the non-Muslim uh, bourgeoisie uh, communities and also by non-Muslim uh, um, interlocutors with the uh, Ottoman uh, government, so translators, diplomats, and so forth. Um, it, it's, um, uh, it is um, physically, if you want to kind of go and soak up the you know, soak up the vibe of uh, liberal nostalgia for the Ottoman era, you would go to the what used to be called the Pera, or what is today the Beyola district of Istanbul, um, and uh, you have you see it in lots of gentrification pro uh, projects, a lot of sort of um, uh, commercial establishments that kind of uh, re sort of. Um, uh, resurrect that feeling of being a part of a uh, late 19th century sort of cosmopolitan um, uh, empire. Um, what work does this do? Um, well, it certainly pushes back against the homogenizing nationalist, ethno-nationalist narrative. Um, it also, I argue, and I'm going to make a similar critical claim um, about uh, Islamist nostalgia uh, for the Ottoman era, it also serves to uh, elide over and gloss over uh, any um, sort of recognition of complicity in the uh, actual elimination of the uh, non-Muslim communities. Um, so, you know, if you are, uh, if you have a, a wine shop called the Victor Levy Wine Shop, or if you have a, um, uh, if you are uh, decorate your home with you know images of Para with um, you know uh, Greek women in you know interesting uh, sort of costume that looks quite bohemian today and so forth, um, then you are uh, acknowledging that these people are part of the sort of uh, the firmament, but you are not actually acknowledging that they're not there today, um, and they aren't there today. Uh, there's 2,000 Greeks left in, uh, in all of uh, Turkey. There was a period in the late 2000s when um, there was some reverse migration from Greece, but I think that's stopped in, in, in recent years. Um, and, uh, and so you, you, you basically, um, by celebrating uh, a past presence, it allows you to uh, ignore a present absence. Um, and uh, when you are... Um, when you are uh, when you're doing that, you know you're not paying the royalties to the uh, the, the descendants of the um, buildings or the properties in which you're uh, situating your celebration of that past. So that's um, uh, uh, that's my critique of uh, liberal um, cosmopolitanism, and it basically boils down to the um, it, at the end of the day, it's a, uh, the unit of analysis of uh, liberal nostalgia for uh, Ottoman Istanbul um, is, remains the, the individual. Um, and this is going to be, a, a, I'm going to juxtapose this with the basic unit of analysis of the um, Islamist uh, nostalgia for Ottoman Istanbul. So moving to that, Homo Islamicus, how does, the, uh, Ottoman, uh, how does Ottoman Istanbul look to him? And it is a him. Um, uh, it is, uh, it harkens back to a much earlier era, 
um, sort of starting with selling the first, this great expansive period, um, and uh, going through to the conquest of Istanbul, which is you know really key symbolic marker um, and uh, and something that's celebrated now every year with ever more extravagant ceremonies. Um, I think it'll be a bank holiday within a couple of years. Uh, it's not it's not quite there yet, but it's um, uh, you know great pageantry, tremendous pageantry going into uh, the remembrance of uh, Ottoman Islamic triumph and expansionism uh, all the way through to the Tula period and then by the time it by the time once we get to Ottoman retrenchment um, the narrative is uh, sort of fizzles out um, and so um, uh, so who are the icons? Um, as I said, uh, Selim the First, uh, Mehmet the Conqueror, uh, Suleiman the Magnificent, um, or the Lawgiver uh, in Turkish. Um, uh, what work does it do? Um, well, again, vis-a-vis -vis nationalism, it challenges, um, as you said, the sort of um, this, uh, ethno nationalist reading of uh, that assigns primacy to um, Turks. Um, uh, so it, it's potentially an instrument for fostering uh, Turkish Kurdish dialogue, although it's not necessarily, I, I don't think Kurds are as receptive. Religious Kurds are receptive to that. Secular nationalist left-leaning Kurds, which is the bulk of the Kurdish opposition movement, are not necessarily as receptive to, I, I think, to um, that framing uh, as, as, as uh, as the Ottoman Islamic nostalgist might, might uh, hope. Um, then there's um, another uh, impact that, uh, another thing that is enabled in terms of concrete policy is this policy of reinstituting properties confiscated from non Muslims, for example. Um, so it has ha had an, uh, an impact there. Um, at the same time, um, and you increasingly see this, I think, in the symbology uh, of. Um, uh, of the past few years, um, it, it also it, there's there's nothing about the Ottoman uh, sort of uh, cosmopolitan framework that, is, as we heard earlier today, that is um, that is liberal, right? There's nothing about sort of the um, wanting of the individual or individual rights. So it's it's communitarian, it's hierarchical, um, it's paternalistic, um, and it can lend itself to a sort of an emancipatory, inclusive cosmopolitan. Uh, way of framing uh, social organization today, but it can also lend itself to a, um, a Sunni, triumphalist, um, uh, militaristic, uh, paternalistic um, uh, way of, uh, of framing the glorious past and, you know, kind of. Uh, in, in terms that could be described as ethno, you know, it, it's basically re replacing ethno nationalism with ethno religious nationalism, um, and uh, th th that is that is narrated in civilizational terms. Um, so, um, in this sense, there's nothing sort of intrinsically emancipatory, liberal, uh, or it may be emancipatory, but not a liberal form of emancipation, uh, emancipation um, in this sort of uh, uh, tangle between. Um, between liberal and Islamist uh, nostalgia for uh, the Ottoman past in Istanbul. Um, what, is, uh, what it basically boils down to is that, okay, uh, this is the, the last time I want to make vis-a-vis -vis this question, is that um, uh, the, in principle, this means in theory, if we're, walk, if, we're, if we're working at the level of kind of ideal types and a priori concepts, which is where I've been narrating uh, the story, um, then it means in principle you, you end up with the, with the basic clash at the end of the day between the sort of um, liberal premise of one form of, uh, the liberal individualistic premise of one form of uh, cosmopolitan nostalgia and the um, communitarian uh, underpinnings of uh, the other form in which, um, so, so in one, uh, the right to dissent of the individual is privileged um, over the, um, over the sensibilities of the community, uh, whereas in the other, the um, you know it's the 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 group uh, dominates. But and this is where I'm closing. This is actually the work that my book uh, in progress is trying to uh, accomplish. Um, uh, you know, I, I, of course, it was a cheap shot because I set up this whole sort of framework and then I said, well, that's actually a straw man and this is really the better approach that you should use. Um, so instead of these ideal typical renditions, um, I think you can also make a case for um, uh, the, Ottoman Islam, uh, the Ottoman past um, uh, with Istanbul as the site, um, but also uh, elsewhere in Turkey as well, um, uh, make a case for homo ludens, which is um, uh, Basically, the idea of man as uh, man or woman as um, uh, as player, uh, 
Um, so rather than the individualistic underpinning or a um, religious conservative uh, underpinning um, for this uh, nostalgic project of reimagining the past in order to redefine the present and future. Um, you can also take a, a perspective in which you look at um, uh, both ordinary people, the, you know, the little people, um, but also the um, uh, also sort of the the the, the, the big um, political uh, figures um, as engaging in a more in, in um, kind of a playful. Uh, not necessarily enjoyable or, or, or amusing, um, but a, um, a sort of ad hoc uh, contingent invocation of both liberal and Islamic and nationalist motifs and tropes and narratives and practices um, in order to advance you know, present day positions and agendas, uh, which uh, you know, we see happening at the level of kind of uh, everyday performances and commercial, sort of the product of the cultural industries, um, but we also see happening in uh, social movements like Gezi. So you had, for example, this very um, powerful image uh, for several days of um, protesters uh, wearing the um, garb of uh, whirling dervishes and actually um, doing, performing the Sema ritual, um, the whirling dervish ritual um, in Gezi Square and as a matter of transnational solidarity in, for example, Brussels, um, you had a, a, a fascinating image of a, um, of a whirling dervish um, wearing a gas mask um, uh, at the Gezi protest, kind of invoking a sort of a Sufi, uh, you know, it's not, there's nothing necessarily Ottomanist about this, but kind of uh, invoking kind of a Sufi uh, sort of message vis-a-vis uh, -vis the sort of um, excessive use of force that, uh, that, that the um, authorities were being um, charged with in the context of uh, the protest. And I think another one that, again, this is not particularly um, uh, Ottomanist or, uh, or nostalgic in its rendition, but in terms of the power of performance as a prism for explaining, uh, um, explaining these forms of low and high political behavior, you also had, you may, have, you may recall there was a standing man, the silent man, um, was it, uh, in the context of the, the, the Gezi protest, who basically stood still in the middle of all of this action. <laughs> Um, and that was a performance through non-performance um, uh, at a time of great tumult that, uh, that uh, suggests that um, reading the sort of political projects in Turkey today, to no matter, uh, to, regardless of to what extent they, they explicitly evoke um, the different aspects of the Ottoman past, either liberal or more Islamic in orientation, um, but reading them as very much kind of ad hoc contemporary political uh, projects and activities, and then you have it also, um, this, these performances uh, being playing out at the level of electoral politics and statecraft, I leave you with the last image of uh, President uh, Erdogan greeting uh, Mahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority at the new presidential palace with, um, and this is not just the Ottomans, this is, uh, these, these costumes are supposed to represent, uh, I think, 17 uh, former Turkic empires over history from the Mediterranean to the Adriatic, um, and they are, um, uh, and you know, here the the message is, I mean, Abbas looks a little bit uh, befuddled. <laughs> I don't know if he was expecting that uh, when he came, um, but this is very much, you, you know, this this got a lot of sort of response on social media. People th said, you know, it looks like a soap opera uh, enactment, but I mean, in fact, on the domestic political campaign trail, um, this type of messaging, uh, is, is, is very uh, powerful for invoking uh, a sense of historical continuity, grandeur, um, uh, benign paternalism, looking after the, the, the rights of the, um, the oppressed Palestinians, uh, you know, and, and, and their uh, correlates at home and abroad. And it's, um, it, it very much is a part of this, this narrative of uh, Ottoman nostalgia. Ottoman nostalgia. Thank you.